Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming to what's going to be an extraordinary conversation. My name is Linda Lees. I'm the Director of Cultural Programming for TAFEF New York. I'm so pleased to have you here. Um, I'm going to add one more piece of housekeeping so I don't forget. Um, this discussion will be live streamed. It is, it is being live streamed on Facebook and then eventually stored the edited version on the website, so constantly available to you. If you want to recommend this to other people, please do. If you want to go back and relive the highlights of this conversation, um, please do that as well. <clears throat> uh, I also want to put in a plug for this, so please pick up the, uh, a copy of this on the catalog desk or the info desk. Um, posing Modernity, the Bach Model from Manet and Matisse to Today. And I'm sure Mark and Denise will explain to us what that is. Totally relevant to this discussion. And uh, further, uh, the title of this panel, which is Retrieving, Retrieving Lost Identities, the Black Figure in Art, Past and Present. So it's an unusual uh, conversation because this conversation really hasn't taken place before in the broader sense. So I couldn't be more pleased to have it here as part of our program. Denise and I had a conversation about this originally the first week of July. So it's taken a while for it to come to fruition, but it is absolutely happening in the right place on the right day. Right? Um, so I will now turn it over to our moderator who will introduce the panel. Uh, who happens to be a buddy of mine, so that's even nicer. Mark Pachter is Director Emeritus of the National Portrait Gallery at the Smithsonian Institution. And just in case you think people who become emeritus sit back on their laurels, I will tell you they don't. Mark's current project is a series of video interviews of laureates, principally in computer science awarded by the Turing Foundation in Mathematics, awarded the Field Medal, and most recently, the 96-year-old awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. So, um, seems like out of the cultural realm, but in fact, it turns out not to be. So, you may have a question for him after this panel is over on that topic. Anyway, uh, enjoy yourselves. This is going to be great. Turn it over to you, Mark. Thanks. Um, I'm going to begin by celebrating Linda's hard work, and not just as a chum, as an appreciator of these, this amazing programming. And we've all had, in the nicest possible way, our arms twisted to come and participate in these amazing events. Four days worth? I don't know how she does it. So first, uh, congratulations. Um, secondly, I want to, I guess as a kid, I would have said brag on this particular session. Uh, it's inspired by uh, an exhibition which is groundbreaking um, and elegant, which is a rare combination, let me tell you, as an exhibition maker. Um, the elegance is throughout uh, in the presentation, and I'm going to urge you, not just hand out a flyer, I'm going to say nobody is going to be able to leave this room without promising to go see the exhibition which is at the Wallach uh, Gallery at uh, Columbia University. It's on West 129th Street. And if you think that's far, just note that it leaves there and goes to the Musée d'Orsay. So it's closer than Paris. So please go through, um, February, 10th. through February 10th. Um, it really inspires this conversation in, in, in so many ways. But let's really think a bit about what it's about, and I'm just going to use Denise's own titles, posing for modernity. So she's immediately, radically, taken her subject out of what might have been perceived as a, a small subject over there and made it central to Western art. Uh, you can't think about Western art the same way after it. So that's amazing. And then when you think about the title of this session, uh, Retrieving Identities, you get at something else which is also very core to the question of what we're going to be discussing, which is really identity as captured on canvas, well, on, in sculpture too, but, and in photography, in, in, the, in the fine arts. 
And why should that matter particularly? I mean, identity matters to all of us. I mean, it's one of the great subjects of our day. But um, I'm going to, I'm a cultural historian. That excuses talking to scientists and artists and art historians. Cultural historians look at things, ideas, in context. And the context that I immediately thought of, both seeing the exhibition and thinking about this session, um, is maybe the greatest American novel of the 20th century, Invisible Man. Um, it certainly is one of the greatest, which is about invisibility and presence. That's really what your exhibition is about, too. Um, but I don't think it's been done in the fine arts before. So that's an amazing um, extension of this insight that you can be there and not there at the same time. So the exhibition will demonstrate that. And the last thing I'm going to say, just pulling out my um, background as the director of the National Portrait Gallery, and that is really, what is a portrait anyway? Um, because portraits themselves, there are images of people in art forever, in all cultures and so forth. When does it become a portrait, and when isn't it, and why isn't it? And very often, it boils down to one specific point, particularity, that we know who this person is. They haven't dissolved into a category. So this is a central conversation for our time, and you're lucky to be present here. And with that, um, oh, oh, last thing, the format. I'm, I've asked each of the uh, panelists to talk for about five minutes. If Denise cheats and talks for six, I'm going to allow that, because she really is the centerpiece of the conversation. And I know we, we all will understand, but not too many more minutes. Um, each panelist will make a presentation. There will be very few images. I'm in control of the slides, so I can guarantee that. Um, and the reason is because we want to have a conversation, the presentation, the conversation among the panelists in response to the comments, and certainly the conversation with you. So that's, that's the rhythm. And with that, I, by the way, I'm not introducing the panelists. Can you read? It's right there that with their titles. I want to go straight to the subject at hand, Denise. Present, present, but not, or there, but not visible. I, I think that is a very um, uh, apt way to lead into the issues that I've attempted to explore in the exhibition, Posing Modernity. Uh, the woman that we see in the portrait here is the model who posed the black maid servant in Edouard Manet's iconic painting, Olympia of 1863. And Olympia is something that everyone encounters, everyone who's inv been involved with art history, studied art history, uh, gone through a BFA, MFA program as a studio artist, because it is generally considered to be a foundational, if not the foundational painting of modern art. So reams, uh, shelves, library shelves full of books have been written about Olympia. Primarily, however, about the white prostitute, uh, the reclining nude uh, for which the painting is named. Very little, if anything, is said about the black woman who stands there right beside her and poses the maid. So this is something that I encountered as a graduate student at Columbia and felt that here is this black woman in full view uh, taking up almost as much pictorial space as the prostitute, yet after 15 minutes of discussion about the painting, the slide flips, nothing is said about this woman at all. And I consider that to be uh, emblematic of an aspect of the condition of diaspora, shall we say. Uh, minority populations, uh, migrant populations, very much present in our society in our immediate personal environment, but often just, uh, just rendered invisible by being ignored. So I set out to try to understand what could be said about this uh, woman who posed the maid in Olympia. And one of the first things I found was that Manet made not just this one image. Manet made three images of the model 
and this is one of them. I'll just take through a couple of issues uh, that I have tried to explore in, uh, in bringing this painting to New York for what we believe is the first time, and in centering it in the discussion of uh, what that figure in Olympia could be uh, perceived to represent. The title of the painting is La Negress. Uh, Mark talked about categories uh, that can be used to obliterate the specificity, the identity of an individual. And that term, which by the way is a very contested term, especially in France among black French populations today, it is absolutely considered to be pejorative today, even though it was common usage at the time. Uh, but one of the issues with that title is that we know exactly who this woman is and we have always known because, or it has been available, the information has been there from the beginning. Because Manet, the artist, recorded her name in the studio session, in the uh, notebook for the studio session about her. He gave us some information. Uh, Laure is her name. Très belle Negress, very beautiful black woman. We can have an entire session about the issues around that. Her address was just 10 minutes from Manet's studio. So one issue is, given the specificity of identity, why uh, she has come down to us in art history, uh, if she is included at all, as the generic Latin address. Uh, the, I, I think uh, another uh, issue is the genre of this work. It is typically described as a study for Olympia. Um, it was the great Linda Nochlin, the feminist uh, art historian with whom I had the honor of taking a seminar during my graduate studies, who pointed out to me that, no, it, it can't be considered to be a study for Olympia. She wears different attire. She is in a different position. This is a portraitizing image that is made specifically to portray this woman. Um, so there are a number, and I think I'm coming up on my four, you know, five minute mark right uh, now. So I'm just going to say uh, presence, um, uh, specific presence, obliterated by uh, generic categorization and left out of the way that we think about uh, not only Manet's portrait of Olympia or Manet's painting Olympia, but about the entire presence, the entire presence that this woman's representation represents, which is the fact that in 1860s Paris, there was an emerging black population in the uh, first 15 years after the final French abolition of territorial slavery. This uh, presence was captured very extensively in photography by many of the same photographers who portrayed uh, Manet and other artists and uh, writers of the period, uh, which indicates that there was a certain level of interracial interface. These weren't isolated populations. They also lived in the same community, the same neighborhood of Paris, the, the, the northern Paris uh, area centered around uh, Place de Clichy. So the more I looked into this figure, the more it became clear to me that we should know who she is, that we should understand that she represents a very specific racial aspect of the social art and artistic milieu in which Olympia was made. And that as we use this image to understand that, I think we can then return to Manet's iconic painting with a broader perspective and with, a new, with new eyes to, uh, to read the full meaning of that painting. In the end, I think uh, Manet is portraying uh, the racial as well as the gender related aspects of modernity in, in, uh, in 1860s Paris life. And that is what this portrait signifies for me. Thank you. Thank you. Allison. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you uh, to Linda and Denise uh, for asking me to participate uh, on this panel. It's a great pleasure to be here today, uh, and I hope that I can add to the discussion. 
Uh, so we see on our left uh, Jan Turup, who was one of the most well-known and successful members of the Dutch and Belgian avant-garde in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He was a very versatile artist. He worked his way through realism, through impressionism, through pointillism. He was one of the first artists to really catch on to what Van Gogh was doing. Uh, but what Turup is best known for is what I'm showing uh, on the right. Uh, he was a champion of symbolism and an art nouveau. Uh, and I chose to show this self-portrait, which he painted uh, when he was studying in Brussels. Uh, when he was about 27, because I think it raises a number of interesting points that can add to this conversation. Uh, the first one being, there were artists of color in 19th century Europe. There were successful artists of color uh, in 19th century Europe. The other thing is that Turup himself, uh, and in this image, this self-presentation, uh, adds some complexity, some nuance, or highlights the nuance or complexity uh, behind this term of the, the black model um, or the portrayal of people of color. He was himself multiracial. Uh, he was born in Java, Indonesia, what is today Java, Indonesia, uh, what was then the Dutch East Indies. Uh, his father was a member of the colonial government. His mother was of half Chinese and half indigenous descent, which was itself um, a very varied population. Uh, not incidentally, uh, that put Turup in the second level of the racial caste. Uh, that was put into place by the Dutch colonial government. So below European colonials, of course, uh, but above native islanders. He left Indonesia uh, at the age of 11. He was sent by his parents to the Netherlands uh, for his education as an artist. And in fact, that was the last time he ever saw uh, either of them. Um, although he had other family living in the Netherlands and maintained a very close correspondence with his father uh, via, via letters, which we still have, which we still have today. So Turup's identity not only raises this point about the complexity that can underlie right, this, this, um, this term of the black model, uh, but it also highlights colonialism and the degree to which representations um, of people of color in the 19th century uh, are very closely tied uh, to the colonial presence, the European colonial presence. And the fourth point that I wanted to raise is that this picture really points to the need to expand the canon. Uh, there's many reasons why Turup's work uh, isn't better known. Uh, for instance, in the United States, one is that most of his paintings are in Dutch museums, most of the literature is in Dutch, so there's a language barrier. But beyond that, historically, there have been the type of narratives that have been prioritized around race, around style, around geography, um, have excluded Turup and have excluded the close study of his work. Uh, for example, the Oxford Art Biography Online mentions none of what I've just told you about his background, uh, despite the fact that Turup himself said that Indonesian art uh, and his Indonesian upbringing, as short as it was, was vital to understanding uh, his symbolist work. Very little study has been done um, of, of what role that might have played in the work that he's been doing. And so what images like this really necessitate is, is thinking more broadly about the canon. So as important as Olympia is, and it is a benchmark image, we need to think, I believe, not only about French modernism in the 19th century, uh, but about how modernism and also how the portrayal of black models is playing out further afield stylistically and geographically, for example, uh, in Belgium, in Holland, uh, in symbolism, in Art Nouveau. Thank you. Francis. I'm here for historical context. Um, the, uh, I actually wanted to speak about Olympia. Can you pull that up? And I asked them to kind of white out the slide a little bit so you can see Lore better. You can see her very, very distinctly, and in but but she has a very beautiful pink dress on, et cetera. But in slides, you can't see her face, which I think is one of the things Denise has pointed out that this very particular expression on her face is something that we really don't see in the many, many illustrations. Um, this is one of the key art historical 
moments and there has been a lot of ink spilled on this picture and I thought I would talk a little bit about that because lore is really hiding in plain sight and it is absolutely extraordinary that after the tremendous amount of attention and actual evolution of the way we've looked at um, this uh, figure in art history, that Denise is now changing again the way, changing radically the way we're, we're looking at it. And I think that's just a, a um, you know, it's a wonderful thing to find that people actually do look again and again and make you see something you didn't see before. I wanted to just give you a little bit of the context of the reception of Olympia, which was painted by Manet in 1863, just to remind you of what was happening in France. Zola was writing Les Misérables, publishing Les Misérables. There were sea changes in in the in French society of all different levels. And when this picture um, was shown at the Salon, all of the people who saw it, mostly guys, because we don't have what the women, a lot of women said about it, but they it really it really upset them. It scared them and it upset them. And one only one critic said, is Olympia waiting for her bath or for the laundress? Um, you know, mentioning the, there, there were about two or three people that mentioned lore, but um, it was, they were so scared of it. They said things like, um, thinness is more bare. It's indecent when you're thin and you're naked. That was a lot worse than being fat and naked. Um, they, one of the critics, Venturi, said, the gaze expresses nothing. This was published in the French paper. Zola, who knew it was revolutionary, but he couldn't even deal with it, um, he, was, he started to talk about the whiteness and the paintbrush and the flatness, et cetera. Um, as time progressed and, and the, there were satirical, very um, uh, sort of vicious representations of it all over the French papers. Um, a famous art historian who we all revered in the earthly paradise, Werner Hoffman, compared it to Goya's Maya Desnuda, and he said, the Maya is a beautiful, dangerous little woman. Olympia, a cheaply adorned Paris prostitute, barring an exotic perfume from the Negress. I mean, just see, he really, you know, he found this image scary and he didn't know what to say of it. Um, then another critic said, arouses a sacred horror, monster of profane love. She's a scandal, an idol, a public presence and power of the skeleton in the society's closet. So this was a revelation of this prostitute. And ever since she has appeared, um, a lot of art historians and people have been wondering, what is she saying to us? And now Denise has completed the conversation because she obviously has this accomplice. This is much more than a maid. She's very clearly looking at her, and I keep on looking at that expression saying, you know, is she saying, oh, what are you going to do with this guy that sent the flowers? Um, you know, I hope you're going to be nice to him, or maybe you're not, or I, I can't quite figure out, but she's definitely extremely um, alive and uh, purposeful in this picture. And I had the privilege in 1969 to be at Vassar College when the great late Linda Nochlin, um scratched off what she was going to teach us for the pro seminar, and she replaced it with the position of women in art, women artists, women in a position of power, all of these different categories. And she launched feminist art history. So we all thought we were 
you know, really on cutting edge. And Linda, as well as a lot of other historians, taught us all about the male gaze, about how we were looking at pictures which were really intended, by and large, to be looked at by men, and that they looked at them in a certain way, and that we looked at them, and that the women who were in them felt about posing from them for them in entirely different ways. Um, so there were uh, there was a lot, enormous amount written and enormous controversies about this picture as its representation of the defiant, empowered woman. Um, so uh, I think as we are marching through the uh, 20s, then the 19... 90s, um, T.J. Clark writes a 50-page essay about this picture, and he is a Marxist art historian, and he writes about the socioeconomic context, and he says almost nothing except, the, oh, he mentions the black maid saying she counts for nothing. I'm like, wow you know, he's really blind. So when I'm rereading this, I'm thinking, oh, you know, all these really interesting art historians, brilliant art historians. My own advisor wrote an, an entire small book about Olympia, which I actually read part of last night. And so then along comes Denise, and she shows me and all of you that in fact what we knew all along half this picture is about this black maid and that she is intriguingly beautifully dressed that she has this incredible bouquet of flowers that she is a partner in crime in this picture and also she teaches us all about the black population that was then in Paris and active and reminds us that, um, that uh, Alexander Dumas was a man of color who wrote the Mousquetaire, and in fact that there is an entire history that we didn't know about and that Denise has discovered. And I find it really, it the show is, very intriguing. And I also just want to say it is in a time in which we live, sort of like the 60s and 70s, the 1860s and 70s, where there was a lot of disruption, complete disruption in the um, mores uh, in a um, in probably a more positive way than the disruption in our mores right now is happening in terms of our politics, but that in contrast to that, um, Denise has kind of thrown a grenade of enlightenment into the room of the way we um, look at uh, art history and that this is really... Um, as they said, the start of something new. So thank, thank you, Denise. You. Um, uh, wonderfully said, all, all three remarks. I, I want to make an aside and then ask a question. Um, the aside is that not too many people know that at the Japan Society right now, there is a, uh, an exhibition by a Japanese performance artist his name has just escaped me. That happens to one at a certain age. But um, in it is Olympia, and he represents both the white woman of undetermined intention and the African uh, descent woman, also of un <laughs> un un unknown intention. And it's very disturbing to see that happen, too, to then an Asian <laughs> looks at these racial categories and in a way sees both of them as the odd other, which is a kind of a nice change from only seeing the white woman as the recognizable one. So that's an aside. The question, which may be my own grenade, but not really, of course, 
um, is that in looking very closely at the exhibition, which again is wonderful, but I think you know I feel that now, um, I was struck talking about dissolving into categories that some of the African American, and it was African American, because I think it was William Johnson I'm, I'm thinking of, you can correct me, also used these categories. Um, there was a woman who was clearly a person uh, known to him who was called the Negress. Uh, that was in one of them, but there were actually a few others. So what's happening here? Is this ironical? Is this uh, thinking the only way anyone's ever going to pay attention to me if I paint a black woman is in this category, known category? What's going on there? Well, I think that what you're seeing is, well, there are two things. Um, most of the work in the show from the 19th century that carries the title Negress is by uh, European, primarily French artists, who are sometimes working from an ethnographic motivation, and uh, which was about uh, making images that uh, depict ethnic types and then ranking those types, using even uh, with pseudoscientific methods of measuring head size, proportion of head size to body size, et cetera. And so the Negress would be in comparison with the Northern European, the Southern European, the Near Eastern, but still in the very meticulous way in which those, some of those figures were rendered, the, uh, the very close attention to details of coiffure, uh, facial features, uh, attire, what comes down to us um, is uh, that, that, that uh, very fraught history, but also images that often reach thus, those of us looking at them today as really uh, well-made images, portrayals of people of color in the mid-19th century. So the term Negress definitely phased out together with the end of empire. That was the other thing. Negress was this way of constructing the woman of color or a people of color as being outside, irreducibly outside Western culture and shown in uh, romanticized, often imagined scenes uh, in Orientalist paintings which were again often visually uh, gorgeous to look at, but the, uh, that the, the servitude of the people of color, the subordination to Europeans was part of the structure of the ideology, of visualization of the ide ideology that justified empire. So with the end, uh, or the beginning of the end of empire, and other things that were happening that modernized uh, 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 European art, it kind of fell from use, even though the paintings by now in museums and private collections, et cetera, retain those titles, uh, retain those titles as their names. So when you, if you fast forward 100, 150 years, and you see, artists, uh, contemporary artists, post-war artists, beginning with uh, the African-American artist Romare Bearden, uh, working in the 1960s through the 80s, uh, and then in the galleries, very uh, living artist, uh, Micheline Thomas, perhaps being one of the best known today, and they are going through their art history uh, or going through art school, they're looking at the history, they're seeing these figures that are very specific, but named, titled, categorized in this generic term, negress. And so as a, as a, a device of critique, um, they will include that term in a painting where they will absolutely record the name of the model, uh, name that person, and then say, uh, Den, to cite the example of Micheline Thomas's work, Une Très Belle Negresse, she is sort of portraying uh, this woman of color uh, as a woman of color herself in a mode that suits her own subjectivity, but also saying that this is the exact type of humanity, the exact type of vibrant personality and physical, uh, um, uh, uh, compelling physical presentation that was categorized and obliterated by the term negress in the past. So by saying din, 
un très belle négresse, you automatic, you set that opposition up of saying this person had a name, this person had a name then, even though they were called la négresse. So it is absolutely ironic. It's an act of critique. It's an act of retrieval, and it's an act of placing the current images in the lineage of this historical material. There was one critic who said, um, is this the warden of purchased favors? And I thought that was kind of actually pretty interesting, that Lore was the warden. In other words, she, she was present enough in the picture to actually be somebody who was maybe even in charge of some of the transaction. Um, so I think that was a kind of, I just wanted to show a close up of her. Well, I think part of what Manet is doing is that by taking the image of a place of sex work, a brothel, from imaginary, from the imaginary orient, to cite another, uh, uh, Linda, well, actually, Edward Sa Said and others use that term, uh, and from the sort of the cosseted boudoir of the Venetian Renaissance, this would be Titian's Venus of Urbino, and placing them in a site of everyday life in uh, 1860s Paris. He is, you know, sort of playing on the idea that these are people that you can walk down the street and, and that you might actually know. And, uh, and that they are colleagues, they're working together, they're paid workers, and that this is an economic condition of, uh, of you know, low uh, or working class origins, uh, the migrant population that, was, uh, uh, that came to Paris in the aftermath of territorial slavery. I think he's saying that this is a present situation and that both of these women represent a lived reality that you can go out into the streets of the city and see. So, and, and you know, it's so not to say that they're not loaded with, uh, with all of the racial uh, and gender baggage of the period. Uh, he still is portraying uh, the black woman in the position of the, perhaps the friend of, but also the servant of the white prostitute. And that itself, uh, one of the real surprises for me in digging into the archives was that that wasn't the universal condition of black women who were in sex work. Uh, I go into the Bibliothèque Nationale and I'm searching for black women maids. Uh, we have an assumption that there's that synonymous. Not true. There were women who uh, were at various levels of this. There were mistresses. There were women who were, you know, the favorites of various uh, prominent men. Uh, they were not always maids. So this is just another window onto the diverse social roles that people of color played uh, in, in Manet's time. But you need to look at photography, you need to look at prints, as well as paintings to get an, a full picture of the diversity of social positions. And all you have period. to do is look at the exhibition because it makes this Would clear. You? And in fact, in the exhibition, I learned that Baudelaire's partner was- Jean Duval, Jean Duval. Um, yes, there were many. Now, I actually wanted back to, to I'm sorry, hold up again. I, she, she wants me to go back to Olympia. Oh, okay. Okay. Because I have a question for Allison. Uh, Wait a second. I'll uh, go next. Okay. okay. Um, Al Allison, yes. rather impertinently, you, you, you had a male on view. Um, do you know enough about uh, Dutch paintings of black women? Uh, do, uh, the answer is, do I know enough? No. Do I know, <laughs> do I know some? Yes, I know a Fair little enough. bit. You know, and this Fair is enough. a topic that I've really just started digging into. There really has not been that much scholarship on Dutch or Belgian uh, representations of either men or women of color. Um, and despite, for example, Belgium's long and very tragic involvement in, in the Congo, um, there are some very interesting images that stand out in my mind. Um, one is a work by a Belgian artist um, named Xavier Mellory, um, who depicts uh, 
Af black or African sailors in the Antwerp docks dancing uh, with white women, probably prostitutes. Um, that's a very interesting image and not the type of image that's often seen and certainly not um, in, in sort of high art, right? These sort of avant-garde circles. Um, there's very interesting imagery that's made by another symbolist artist, um, Fernand Knopf. Um, one hard thing is that, to be quite honest, a lot of these images are to put it diplomatically, as Denise said, loaded with the racial and gender baggage of, of the time. And so many of them reinforce stereotypes and power dynamics that we are now correctly very uncomfortable with. And <clears throat> when despairs of the Dutch changing, because the, one of the great controversies of this moment is the use of a black caricature um, figure um, in their Christmas celebrations, and they are completely resisting, I mean they, some in the society are resisting, even acknowledging this as caricature. So first you at least have to understand the obliteration of identity, you have to understand the presence of categories which can move to the ridiculous, and so forth, before you can even enter a broader discussion of humanity in this context. Mm -hmm. Please. Can, can I put, uh, just to continue that discussion with Allison, one of the reasons that I was really intrigued by your subject is that uh, everything you say is true about historical uh, images of people of color in Dutch art, but also uh, Dutch museums are among the most progressive in taking a look at that archive and specifically the anonymous categorization of using racial names uh, as even when the individuals portrayed are known, their identities are known. Uh, the Reich Museum, for example, has, uh, has, has undertaken a multi-year project, and that's how long it takes, that's how extensive the archive of these images are, is to review every image of a person of color in their collection uh, to see what the archive can produce about who they were, what their social position was, and if possible to change those names, getting rid of the racial terms, and either describing them by their actual name, if known, or just their social position, you know, a carpenter, uh, a dock worker, a sailor, without the pejorative Dutch vers version of Negress. And that is actually something that is very it's controversial. Uh, the, the conservatives will say, you know, this is uh, African American style, you know, sort of uh, political correctness. Uh, but the uh, the more progressive voices in Dutch cultural life are absolutely uh, moving forward in a very aggressive way to look at that archive and to make those corrections where possible. No, and I think, Denise, you touched on a very, really interesting... Very short, because yep. we'll need yep. questions from the audience. Please, go Sorry. ahead. Uh, Denise, you touched on a really interesting point. I was actually recently at the, the Rijksmuseum and, and was struck by exactly what, what you were struck by. Um, and to me, it highlights the degree to which these images, despite being you know, over 100 years old, this topic is still a live wire. And the, how these images are displayed, how they're discussed, how they're contextualized is still very important and still has a lot of political and cultural resonance resonance today um, and that and I think that includes your your exhibition that this this is an ongoing unfolding unfolding conversation um, that we're having I think one of the great things that Very quick, Denise discusses is when you look at this picture now you say whose job would you rather have and um, right I mean uh, so that's a, that's an entire discussion which has been now even expanded on, but it certainly is still relevant. And if I can add one, one point to that, part of what you can say is radical about this painting is that Manet portrays the black maidservant without bearing her breast, okay? Uh, which is an absolute sign of servitude, of slavery, of you know, exotic other. So to, play, to give, put her in Parisian working clothes uh, and as a wage earner in a Paris place of sex work is itself a, a radical act. It seems, perhaps, it seems right today, but in the context of the imagery of the time, it was part of what people hated about this painting. 
Uh, now from the audience, uh, are there any questions? No question. Oh, back there. Oh. Um, I learned from uh, Judy Chicago that if you want your own history, you have to begin your own history. So I think present day, when you go to universities, you have um, the um, wonderful opportunity to learn about women's studies, black studies. Uh, at FIT on 27th Street, they just started, uh, I believe, Caribbean studies. So thank you for a lovely lecture. Yes, uh, over here. I know who I'd rather be in that one, but I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to ask you a question about the, <laughs> the portrait um, of Michelle Obama. And I was just, if you don't mind, crossing over to contemporary art, so to speak. Um, so the reaction was, there was a, quite a reaction. I was curious what you felt, Den Denise, is it? Did I, of uh, when that happened, or any of you can speak to it, but just in respect to, um, were you happy with what you heard and saw, and do you think we're moving in a, a new positive direction, especially since it was akin to Hindi Wiley, which was so obvious that it was President Obama, and it was a woman, of course, um, Cheryl, I'm sorry, I'm going blank on the, uh, on the woman artist name, but if you could speak to that, that would be great, thank you. I had great admiration for the por portrait and for the artist Amy Sherald who made it in that I, the first thing I admired is that it did break, it, it was radical, it was a radical portrayal of a, uh, of this eminent figure, the first lady, lady, when most artists would, even if they're radical in their other work, they would feel that here they have to be conventional. So the fact that she broke out of the convention and gave her this, you know, this, this, compelling, uh, ravishing, sartorial style, and then very carefully portrayed her face uh, very, spe very specifically. Uh, I think the combination of that and just the grandeur, the scale of it, I've seen it at the National Portrait Gallery. And every time I go, people are just mesmerized, they're taking photos, they're bringing their young children to look at them, and look, watching the kids look up at it, you know, it's sort of mouth agape, just in awe, I think, is exactly what she attempted uh, to accomplish, and I think she did. The uh, portrait of President Obama is just as radical. Absolutely. Uh, also by man. an African-American artist. Absolutely, and, and, and surrounding him with symbolic uh, flower uh, or vegetation, showing him as a thinking man. It's, it's radical for our own time in that it doesn't necessarily, it portrays power, but power, the power of a thinking man, which is something that you know, we very much could use in these times, as opposed to the power of force and strength. Okay, the next question. Hi, Denise, this is a question for you. Um, so I, before I'd ever thought about you know, the, the racial thing in Olympia, one of the things I'd always notice about this painting is how covered up you know, Laura is compared to Olympia because she could have been less, you know, I mean, not in the way that you said with the breast exposed, but she's like really covered. Like there's no part of her body except her neck and her face and her hands that's visible. So I was just wondering if you could comment on that, you know, it's well, really interesting. Yes, it is interesting. And this is something that uh, another of our, of our uh, feminist art historians, uh, uh, Anne Iganay, at Columbia University helped me with. And that, it, the way that that is, uh, you can read that as she's wearing this kind of oversized baggy dress that doesn't really fit her well, but Annie Ganet, who is a fashion historian in part of the 19th century, points out that it's totally consistent with the, uh, the very full sleeves and the bouffant crinolines that were part of Second Empire fashion and that it shouldn't necessarily be seen as a misshapen, unstylish thing. If you look at the way the, the, the sleeves are, they have that uh, embellishment at the elbow, and then they're kind of falling back. So that, 
I think there is a real, I think there is openness to interpretation as to whether the old, uh, that it's baggy, that it doesn't fit, it's misshapen, or the new, that it's uh, a particular style and that the stance in which she's posing may give the impression that she's perhaps obese, when in fact we know from the portrait and from Manet's own description of her that he didn't see her as obese and didn't attempt to portray her as such, which feeds back into the idea that it's fashion. There's another question, but I know Alice and you have a comment? Yes. Um, the other thing to realize is that this manner of portrayal, this motif, is something that Manet repeats. So, for example, three years later, uh, in his Young Lady of 1866, which is a painting that's hanging at the Met, so I know it well, uh, he depicts the same white model, Victorine Morgan, uh, in a shapeless pink dress that, color, that covers her from head to toe. And in fact, one of the objections to that painting was that it didn't give a sense of the body beneath it. And that, of course, at the time is a kind of tease, because obviously everyone already knew what she looked like, stark naked. But I think that this is, this is an aspect of femininity and of dress and of costume and of this contrast between being clothed and a sense of the body underneath that Manet is, is playing with and something that sticks in his mind uh, as an artist over a period of time. We have a question in the back. At the Walters, um, okay, at the Walters in Baltimore, there is a portrait of a nurse and a young child. Um, and the child reads, she's a, Medi a Medici, um, if I'm not pronouncing that right, I'm sorry. Um, and it's fascinating because apparently the young child was painted out of the portrait for many years until they discovered it. And so I'm wondering, my question to you is, have you, talking about identity, noticed or have found other images of uh, children? Because this child was interracial. Um, have you discovered other images where blacks have been painted out because of power dynamics or uh, they were too provocative or even too beautiful because it occurred to me that this is the only image that I've ever seen of a nurse catering to an interracial child and the power dynamics and she's beautifully painted and so is the nurse but for very many years she was painted out, literally painted out. The one example that I can think of relates to uh, Jean Duval, who was the subject of the fourth, of Manet's fourth image of uh, a black woman. Uh, she is uh, depicted by Manet in a billowing, extremely stylish white dress. She was the mistress of his good friend, Charles Baudelaire, and kept in high style, known as a fashion icon, et cetera, in her time. But that was an extremely controversial relationship. Uh, Baudelaire was censored for a volume of poetry, Les Fleurs du Mal, that he wrote in large part in tribute to Jean Duval. And at around this time, Courbet, Gustave Courbet, was making a painting, uh, the studio, L'Atelier, and he was depicting uh, the various writers and artists of his circle, including Baudelaire. And this is a, a gigantic painting about the size of that wall back there that is in the Orsay right now. A uh, recent x-ray analysis has suggested that Courbet initially painted an image of Jean Duval, uh, Baudelaire's biracial mistress, hovering over above the image of uh, Baudelaire, but painted it out under the influence of the controversy, the public controversy, there was a time when Baudelaire actually stood trial, was forced to stand trial on charges of obscenity because of the poems he had written about Jean Duval. So the economics of it, a gigantic painting, the patron perhaps didn't want it, but what they have discovered is what they suggest is pentimento, or sort of a shadowy remainder of that image that was painted over, that they describe in the gallery label that is on view today at the Orsay. And this is about seven years before Manet makes a monumental painting of Duval uh, in the same style that he had just portrayed his own wife. So, to, so yes, there is history when uh, the figure of color doesn't fit the current ideological you know, framework. Then they're, physic they're literally obliterated as well as narratively obliterated when, even when they're left in plain view. Uh, I'm going to uh, close the session. I think we, we're at the end, but I just want to say something that seems to me 
it's incumbent on me as the former director of the National Portrait Gallery to just make one observation in relationship to this. Uh, there were historically very few portraits of African Americans in the National Portrait Gallery. That was argued for lots of reasons. One of the reasons, a more benevolent one, there are other reasons, was that um, they were rarely painted as individuals, and the National Portrait Gallery is about portrayal of particular people. You can take that or not, but that was certainly one of the, one of the positions. But I want to leave with, with an image of Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was a person who could not be denied as a person politically in the American 19th century. I, I'm sure you all know who he was. But it's very interesting that in the quite beautiful portrait we have of Frederick Douglass, um, his skin tones are much lighter. And what they're saying is, if you are going to come out of the void, you had better have attributes of whiteness, or we will compliment you with those attributes. And we also have, happily, an incredible daguerreotype of Frederick Douglass, which looks the way he really did look, and it bears very little relationship to the painting. I think Kehinde Wiley is the heir of this idea of the irony, or many other things, of putting African, African Americans in the context of European power, it's a, and having them in the forefront, having them be very much themselves against uh, you know, the, the, the irony of the classical European backdrop. So this, this discourse is revolutionary now in all aspects of, of Western art, I think. Thank you very much. I promised you, <laughs> and they delivered. It's fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. There's still five more events this coming week, so please have a look and please come back and visit with us again. Uh, I couldn't be happier to be hosting this great conversation, and once you see this exhibition, you will understand exactly how revolutionary it is. It will, it's, it's transformative, that's my view. So thank you so much, and uh, have a great rest of your time here. Uh, one more hour before we close. <laughs> Thank you again. Thanks to this great panel.